Hello, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are around the world. As uh, many of you imagine, uh, we wanted to be in Copenhagen this beautiful spring. Unfortunately, the circumstances uh, did not allow us to get together. I was looking forward to meeting many of you. Um, I am very grateful uh, to Hel Martins and the team behind uh, this great conference uh, for putting together a fantastic program. I hope you have enjoyed the last couple of days. Um, I'm going to start with a short personal story to share with you about my own journey. Um, I come from Colombia, originally from Bogota, and uh, I moved to the US to um, get my um, graduate degree. My background is in industrial design, and um, I have been fortunate uh, to work in many different countries around the world with some uh, great minds in uh, product design and technology. Uh, throughout my career, I have uh, had many different titles and roles. What's more interesting about uh, my uh, journey is that throughout my career, only uh, I have as many uh, titles with the word designer on them as I do of engineering. And I'm pretty sure many of you um, uh, see uh, or have seen yourself in, in a similar situation. So I want to start with a question. What is driving digital transformation? Is, is, is it the CEO? Is it the CTO? Is it the design? Is the, is the design? Is the chief design officer? Or is it the coronavirus? I think we have to recognize that this is not normal. This is not a large uh, work remote experiment. The conditions have changed dramatically for everyone around the world. So the question is, what can we as designers do with ourselves, with the teams and the organizations that we work with? So I want to take you through a path of reflection, uh, a path of reflection that uh, has to do a lot of, with ourselves as individuals, with our team and the impact, our teams and the impact that we can have in the organizations that we work in. So let's start with a little bit of um, the path of individual reflection. The world is going a thousand miles an hour and under the current circumstances and the stress that we're all experiencing, we are leaving very little space to reflect on our uh, personal journey, our personal health and our personal well-being. I have spoken with many managers uh, over the last uh, several weeks and the theme that's coming constant is that they are worried about their teams, the people that they care for, but they are leaving, uh, as I mentioned, very little space for them uh, to reflect and um, uh, to take care of themselves. And we have to create that space, whether it's under stressful circumstances or under a more normal traditional routine. So one of the things that I uh, talk to many, many designers uh, throughout uh, in my career, and especially over the last several years, is about uh, defining uh, who they are and what they are up to. Um, uh, many interviews, I start with asking them, uh, tell me about yourself, but I don't want a biographical uh, recount of who you are. I want you to tell me who you are from a professional and personal perspective and what value you bring uh, to the table. And it is very, very interesting to see how people uh, react to that question and how they define uh, and present themselves. So, as I mentioned, how do we introduce ourselves, whether in a formal situation, in a more um, informal situation, a networking event or a cocktail party? Um, a good friend of mine in uh, New York actually has one of the best brands that I have seen, five words that define who she is and what she values. People, then process, then things. You don't have to guess what is first for her. It is very clear, it is the people. And she makes a very, very uh, big emphasis on relationships, on building connections and uh, creating bridges uh, between people, whether they're in, in her organization, in her network or in her personal life. And you can see that in a very simple message, we can define who we are and what kind of um, a brand uh, do, we, do we live by and principles do we live by. So the question that I have for each one of us is, 
What kind of leader am I? Or why do I aspire to be a leader? Uh, many times uh, people answer the question when they are uh, in their journey, I just want to manage people. And I would challenge you, the idea of becoming a leader is not to manage somebody else. It's actually to help them grow and develop. Uh, so what are the parts of that leadership journey? Uh, you may be a team of one. I have been a team of one in my career in different stages. Um, I have also been part of a, of a team as a contributor or as a manager of people. Are you a new manager? Or are you an established manager now developing and growing a, a, a team? Or are you a leader of leaders growing and uh, expanding the impact and the emphasis of design in your organization? I would also want to uh, frame this conversation from the perspective of how important and how critical it is for us to have a choice, um, dual path in our journey. We don't have to become managers. We don't have to lead, lead people uh, to progress in our careers. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in just um, a second later. Uh, you know, our job as leaders, and especially under the current circumstances that we're facing, is to facilitate and enable the people in our team um, to, to be successful and to do their job and to be able to uh, create a sphere of influence that they need uh, around their teams. We have to make sure that we create the space for them uh, so they can do their work. We have to create the space not only for our teams, but also for the people that are around us. Uh, and that could be uh, not only on our um, professional lives, but also on our personal lives. As I mentioned to you, we're caring uh, for the people in our teams, but we also need to care about ourselves. Uh, we need to give ourselves the space uh, to stay healthy and to stay um, uh, full of energy. If we are not able to maintain uh, the strength and the health in our own personal uh, situation, we will not be able to help our teams uh, uh, continue doing their work and continue developing. So it is super, super critical that as leaders um, or uh, uh, people in, in, in developing our, our leadership journey, uh, that we have uh, the state of mind and the space to uh, stay healthy. And that sometimes means also giving people the space that they need to take care of uh, the, their families and, and the people in their, in their lives. And under the current conditions uh, of um, isolation and um, shelter in place, uh, we have to understand that our productivity might change, our productivity might uh, be reduced, but we cannot hold people accountable for uh, reduced productivity under the current circumstances. And I think um, as leaders, uh, we're also responsible for designing the organizations um, that we are involved in. Um, very recently, a uh, senior person in, uh, in one of the teams that I was working with asked me, uh, Jose, when did you stop uh, designing? And I was surprised because that person was actually very serious about it. Um, and then I, I, I thought to myself, uh, the fact that I'm not doing wireframes, that I'm not working in uh, uh, visual design tools or, or sketching tools, uh, does not mean I stop being a designer. Actually, right now I'm working in a different scale of a design problem. I'm working on des designing the team, uh, designing the career path, uh, designing the type of impact that we want to have in, uh, or we could have in an organization. So it is very, very important for us to uh, consider that and keep that in mind as our career evolves. We might be uh, moving away from one aspect of our uh, design uh, craft uh, to a more of a, a design a, a statementship uh, or um, a higher level of, of the work that we do. I also want to think um, and ask uh, uh, the people that I work with and the teams that I work with, uh, whether it's on, on a consulting practice or in an in-house design team, uh, what, what is our focus? What is your focus? Are you a player or a coach or are you somewhere in between? And uh, the reality of, uh, of uh, our uh, current uh, uh, economic environment indicates that many of us 
are somewhere in between. Um, you know, whether it's uh, love, lopsided to, to one uh, aspect or another one, uh, but uh, anywhere in between. And the most important thing is really to strike a balance uh, that will help uh, our team and ourselves in, in as we move and forward uh, the, the cost of designing the organizations and the people uh, in our teams in the organizations. One of the uh, exercises that I run in my workshop is really to force uh, or to uh, more than forcing uh, working with uh, with people um, and the leaders uh, that that participate in these uh, activities uh, to ask them, do you where, where do you fall in that spectrum of uh, player and coach? Do you do things instead of uh, letting people and giving the opportunity of people in your team to do them? Uh, do you tell them what to do or do you start teaching, developing their skills, asking them questions and coaching them and challenging in their assumptions and in their hypotheses? Depending on where we are in that spectrum, we are either doing things for ourselves at the detriment of uh, developing our team or helping our team develop and our people in, in the organization grow uh, with the um, acquisition of new skills and new perspectives and new ideas. So I'm going to leave you with a, a very quick uh, a framework to do this exercise and, and for you to reflect how much time during a day, during a week, during a month, uh, during a quarter, do you spend uh, in, this, in this spectrum? Doing, telling, teaching, advising, or coaching people. And depending on where you are in, in your particular uh, career and your situation, you will fall uh, somewhere in between. And there's not a right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of reflecting, where am I now? And where do I want to be in the future? How do I want to grow my career? How do I want to help grow others? A good friend of mine, uh, Jason Mesut, a British uh, designer, had spent the last um, uh, roughly 10 years working on a very, very interesting project called Shaping Design. And in this uh, body of work, uh, Jason has um, done it for himself, but more importantly, have helped hundreds of designers around the world uh, reflect on their own craft, uh, on their own core skills as designers, on their foundational skills as people. You know, do I uh, speak eloquently? Am I able to frame a problem? Am I a good at a storytelling? And also, uh, as I am embarking in a leadership journey, where do I fall in the, the, the framework, uh, in the map of, of, uh, of leadership? So let me show you uh, uh, the, the framework that Jason uses and that I have also leveraged uh, uh, to help teams that I uh, work with and uh, to coach people. Um, you know, you could be falling into the, I work and I concentrate most of my time in the team, or I can be working more on creating impact in the wider level of the organization. So if, for example, you're a person that um, leads a design operations uh, team, you might be focusing a lot of your time in enabling the team, the people, uh, the processes, the infrastructure for that team. If you are the head of design for a, for a team, uh, then you're probably, uh, for an organization, you're probably more working, uh, working in a wider perspective, uh, helping uh, uh, your, your colleagues uh, at the leadership level understand what is the impact of design and how your team is helping enable those organizational goals. Uh, you could also be working on, uh, you know, a little bit of the, the practice level uh, or helping define the vision and the strategy. So it is very important for us to be able to um, understand where do we fall in the, in the leadership map today and where do we want to be in the future. And uh, pay attention to some of these uh, uh, signals um, of, of, of time that we are spending and, and figure out okay, uh, I might need some help in terms of understanding the wider impact of the organization or developing my skills around vision and strategy or uh, giving back to the community. So all of these things are elements of the reflection that we as leaders 
can help our team um, do. And then we as individuals can also reflect on our own and uh, present uh, ideas and discuss uh, proposals of how we can evolve uh, professionally uh, with uh, the leaders of our, of our team and our, and our own uh, managers. I'm going to show you a very quick video of uh, how these um, shapes of design uh, look like uh, for, for different people in a, in a group. And as you can see, the, the shapes uh, vary widely in, in size and, um, and form. Um, and the most interesting thing is that it's okay. It's okay to have actually a, a very different perspective on, on where you are spending time. Uh, however, it's also very important to analyze, am I spending too much time in an inward looking perspective or should I look uh, should I expand my, my, my perspective of the outside view of my team or the immediate sphere of influence that we have? So all of these uh, um, uh, analysis and self-assessment uh, perspective and reflections on our own will help us. It is also very interesting to see how uh, many uh, open roles say, head of design needed must be an expert in wireframe, must be an expert in tool A, B, and C. However, the closer I, as a head of a practice, am to the wireframe, the further away I am from the strategy. Is that where I want to be? Is that where the uh, highest level impact of a leader will be on making wireframes? or on helping the organization define what the strategy of the product, what is the strategy of the, um, of the product and the group and the pricing of that organization for uh, the products and services, or is it at the uh, level of making something? Uh, so we have the opportunity to uh, shape uh, what is the, the type of role that, we, that, we, that we're looking for and what is the type of roles that we publish also uh, to uh, get and attract uh, talent to our organizations. So um, uh, last year, uh, Todd Seiki Warfel uh, published one of the uh, most interesting and uh, broader independent uh, studies uh, around um, his skills and craft uh, uh, skills and um, uh, leadership uh, profiles. And in this um, uh, work, uh, basically, uh, Todd uh, recommends uh, and, and finds out that people actually have to reshape their skills profile as they evolve in the organization. We have to start making room uh, to new skills that are going to help us get to that future stage, to that new stage of our careers. And that way, we can also help others uh, grow in their um, uh, fundamental skills so they can later help others develop. So let's take a quick look at what uh, uh, Todd uh, does in, in his um, uh, professional profiles uh, uh, skills uh, uh, map. And basically he puts it, uh, and this is just one of the examples of the makers versus managers. As you can see in the makers uh, uh, profile, there is a lot of space for craft, a lot of space dedicated for craft and very little um, space um, uh, dedicated for ownership or influence, for example. However, as you move uh, in, the, in the ladder uh, to managers or, or leaders, and it could be uh, managers of people or leaders of people or leaders of, of a particular um, area or body of work, uh, you see that the craft uh, moves out of that uh, uh, profile and the uh, skills that you need in the uh, influence, for example, uh, grow and you have to develop them to, be, um, to have a larger impact in that organization. Uh, the, the work that um, uh, Todd uh, has published is, is very, very, very powerful. And I recommend that you um, uh, take, a, take a look at, at, at his work in the uh, Career Index Report. So from an individual perspective, I talked to you about your personal brand, uh, the focus, uh, whether you're a player or a coach or where do you fall in between. Um, we talk about how uh, you spend your time and where do you, you know, what is your shape in that uh, uh, leadership map perspective? And also, what are the skills in your uh, leadership profile? 
Where do you need to grow so you can help others uh, grow and develop? And you also can grow yourself and be prepared to the new challenges that the future brings to us. So now let's take a look at uh, a, our, our team reflection. So we started with us as individuals and, and uh, now let's take a look at how we can help our team. Many of us see our team or see our teams uh, as the, this group of, of superstars and they are, but they need some help. Many times they are full of enthusiasm uh, but they need some uh, coaching, some direction, uh, some uh, uh, steering of uh, uh, where to go rather than everybody going uh, to the ball like a swarm. Uh, so we, we, have to, we have to recognize these situations where many, many, sometimes uh, people in our team need that, that help. Um, so let's take a look at uh, some of the, the, the work that, um, that we have done. Um, last year, um, with uh, some of the, the work that we have done in terms of uh, design operations and uh, uh, leadership um, uh, analysis, uh, we ask our teams, um, you know, let's, let's, let's draw the organization. Uh, give me a picture of the organization. But that picture uh, is not one of the hierarchy. Okay, this is the CEO, this is the chief design officer, this is where the managers are. What we wanted to get was a more of a metaphor. Uh, what came out was super interesting and the discussion around uh, the, the drawings was fantastic. And this is just one example where uh, a person uh, created the, the Death Star or drew the Death Star and uh, uh, they call it the technology organization. And then around it, like little satellites or like little TIE fighters, uh, they drew the design teams going in different directions and trying to shoot um, uh, from the TIE fighter, uh, a very small craft, to the Death Star to no avail, no change, no, no change of direction, no influence. So just the, the depiction of a metaphor will tell you a lot about uh, how the organization, uh, how you view the organization and some of the challenges that you see uh, are in front of you to uh, impact and exert some, some change. Uh, in another workshop, actually, um, a multi-country manager uh, for a large um, a multinational film, firm uh, it drew the organization. This time wasn't just the technology uh, a organization as the Death Star, but the, the, the entire organization was like this big monolith. It was like a, a concrete, heavy uh, Roman or Greek columns uh, uh, keeping uh, you know the weight and the structure in place, and then in the roof of that um, uh, drawing and that metaphor, uh, you had two groups: one that looked like more like the uh, hiding or hidden sharpshooters, uh, as snipers, and then the other one, one like a, a, a communications team with a, a little bit of a beam trying to communicate with the outside world. And that's how this person view design in that in that organization. So it is super interesting, uh, and and the 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 out, actual output of this uh, exercise is not the most important thing. What it is more important is actually the discussion that it generates and how people engage and talk about uh, the the way they view the organization and the challenges that they uh, outline. I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, a few minutes ago, the need to have a dual path or a dual track career ladder. Uh, many, many uh, people have talked about these. Um, Kristen Skinner and Peter Merholz in their org design uh, for Design Orbs book talk about these. Um, the same way as um, uh, Nick Fink actually very recently in the Interaction Latin America in Medellin in Colombia last year uh, did um, about the importance of a dual uh, path career track. And the problem or the challenge that um, Nick uh, discusses is that if you have a single career path where a, an individual contributor, highly productive, has to become a manager to progress his or her career, then you're uh, uh, curtailing their, their, their options. You're, you're shortcutting uh, their professional uh, growth and potentially setting them up for failure. 
So as managers and as people designing the organization, the design org, we have the responsibility to create the paths that are actually conducive to people uh, developing in, in the organization. A couple of very good examples of these dual career paths are um, emerging. For example, uh, McKinsey uh, didn't have uh, designers as uh, partners in the organization less than uh, uh, five years ago. And now there many, many designers have grown to these positions of leadership that were reserved before only uh, for business leaders or uh, industry experts. Uh, on the other uh, side, we have um, a, an organization like IBM. Uh, after Phil Gilbert, Phil Gilbert took over, uh, he actually worked with his uh, uh, team to develop um, a dual career track. And now we have in an organization like IBM, uh, distinguished designers, uh, where before uh, the distinguished uh, uh, distinction was only reserved for engineers, not, not designers. So it is very, very encouraging uh, that in industry and high profile organizations are promoting these. So other organizations uh, might take a look and say, Let's see what makes sense for us so we can promote the future and the development of the people in our teams. Another key factor that we need to take into account and in consideration for our teams is how, what kind of shape of designers or professionals do we, do we uh, leverage and do we build our, our teams with? Obviously, the two or the, the most typical is the T-shape. So let's take a look. Um, when we're talking about the T-shape, the traditional one, you know, you you know a little bit of a little bit of everything, superficial knowledge on uh, research, interaction design, product design, uh, service design, visual design, you name it. But then you have a very, very deep perspective and knowledge on one of those particular disciplines. So you are more of a specialist. Um, a profile. Larger organizations tend to uh, favor or have the, the budget and the luxury and the opportunity uh, to have uh, a good footprint of, um, of a specialist within their, their ranks. On the other side, you have what Jared Spool uh, calls the broken comp profile. It's not a T-shape where one area is very deep, but actually all the areas have different depth and different level of expertise. And that generalist profile actually is very versatile. It's uh, able to uh, do some research, then jump into uh, some product uh, design and even a strategy, and then switch to uh, polishing some visual design. So depending on the, on the size of your team, you might benefit more from having a group of generalists and if you have a larger team, then you can have and develop a group of specialists. For example, uh, have a, a specialist uh, service design practice or research practice in your ranks. Another key aspect in terms of the reflection that we have to have in terms of our teams is how do we recognize them? Uh, Katie Dill, uh, the head of uh, design for Lyft, actually wrote a fantastic uh, article about uh, the recognition framework. And she says, you know, if you recognize the people, but the people in your team do not understand that recognition language, they basically assume and perceive that they are not being recognized, that they are not valued. Is that what we want to do? So obviously that's not what we want to do, <laughs> uh, but Katie uh, uh, drills into basically six, uh, excuse me, five areas of the recognition framework, encouragement, reward, time, autonomy, and visibility. And probably the most uh, common ones are uh, encouragement, uh, an email thanking you for your work, a uh, pat in the back um, in, a, in a public setting saying, uh, you know, recognizing the work that you do. But some people may not 
like to be recognized publicly. They might like uh, or they might need a more uh, private level of recognition. So that's a very interesting perspective that we have to uncover and discuss with the people in our team. Rewards, that's probably the, the most common one. Title and compensation. Um, so I'm not going to, to get into that, but, but people, people might, might react better to that uh, particular dimension of, um, of uh, the recognition framework. Time is something that, particularly in the current circumstances that we are all going through, we need to be fully aware of the time that our people need from us and the time that we need from our leaders as well. Um, an example of, uh, of time, uh, you know, some people like to uh, speak publicly, for example. Are you giving them the opportunity? Are you creating the space for them to do that? Um, when they go to a local meetup, uh, do you and your team or your team go to see them speak or present or uh, have a panel discussion? That is a very, very simple example of how uh, time becomes an important uh, mode of recognizing a person's effort. Autonomy and empowerment, it's a super key. Um, in a conversation I had with Andreas Hauser um, uh, a couple of years ago, he, he related the story of how the first um, app house uh, a co-design center in uh, Germany uh, got... Uh, uh, furnished and he basically told the team this is the budget you go take care of uh, uh, furnishing um, and he thought you know they're going to go higher end places uh, mostly new or basically new stuff to his surprise the team took a multifaceted approach they went to eBay and got uh, used uh, things they went to antique stores and got some antique pieces they also got to Ikea and, uh, and some higher technology places to, to furnish uh, their space. And they became basically um, autonomous and empowered to create their own space. Obviously, that is a very specific example and not very few of us uh, have the opportunity to tell our teams, yeah, go create your space. However, we can, we can find uh, together with our team projects that they can become empowered to drive. A very specific example about that, a few years ago, I was working with a researcher. She wanted to um, develop uh, her own research uh, project um, around personas for that particular organization and that product set that uh, she was working on. But there was never the opportunity nor the space to do that. So we worked together uh, to create the space and basically create the persona project for her. And she took the uh, opportunity to uh, interview people, uh, bring the team along to the, to the interviews and the research findings, and then creating this uh, uh, library of personas that then she was able to showcase uh, to the organization and to the teams that she was working with. And that is a very simple example of a type of project that could feel and uh, recognize the people uh, on, on the areas that they need in terms of empowerment and autonomy. And last but not least, uh, visibility. Um, Chris Abor, when he was in NASDAQ, um, he used to um, say that anybody in the team should be able to deliver uh, the, the, the deck, the pitch deck for the team to a new project or, an, or a new uh, uh, part of the organization. And his perspective was anybody from the most senior people in the team to the most junior people on the team should know the content, should be able to contribute to the content and should be able to deliver it. And that not only gives visibility to, to folks in different areas of the, of the team across the structure, but also empowers them to be part of the story that the team brings and delivers. The last aspect around the recognition framework how do you find out how people want to be recognized or how do they value uh, the recognition? Uh, Katie Dill uh, gives us a very simple uh, example. If you don't know, ask them. So uh, ask them questions is like, you know, so the last time that you felt recognized, tell me a little bit about that. Or the last time that, you know, uh, you, you receive a reward, uh, what did that feel? Or ask them, if you're in my position, you know, if you were the manager, how would you recognize a person? 
And that is uh, basically a little bit of a discovery and research as to how we can uh, recognize our teams. And it is very important that we um, increase the language of recognition that we have in our toolbox so we can uh, work effectively uh, with the different uh, uh, types of people in our organization. So I told you about uh, uh, the, the, team, uh, the team reflection. And basically I talked about the team brand, uh, the team profiles, the career ladder, and the recognition framework. So now let's take a look at uh, how do we measure impact in our organizations. So the McKinsey study, the business value of design, and they are now publishing um, additional materials uh, and profiles on, on leadership uh, around the business value of design. It is a very, very good body of work. Uh, my challenge to, to people that say, oh, but we knew that 10 years ago. Well, where 10 years ago or the last 10 years, the business partners, the CEOs and the executives listening to you with the information you knew? Or are they listening to organizations like this one in particular uh, when they're defining the strategy and evolving and, and, and growing? So rather than rejecting it because it was something we knew, it is uh, a matter uh, or an opportunity for us to embrace it and, and take advantage of the message and the messengers uh, to be able to um, exert and expand our influence in the organization. And the McKinsey study is, is very interesting. It was a longitudinal, longitudinal study for over five years. They collected over 2 million data points and they um, uh, basically track about 100,000 uh, design actions that uh, had a particular impact in, in, in organizations. What they found is super, super telling. Uh, and more than the uh, revenue and the growth, I want to concentrate on, on basically what companies didn't do that they talked to. Uh, many companies, almost 40% uh, of them, did not talk to customers before launching a product. Uh, for us, that's how do you not do some research or do have a voice of the customer or a customer experience program? Well, uh, this study found that they, actually companies don't do that. Um, the other uh, super interesting uh, uh, finding and a huge opportunity for us is the fact that almost two thirds of the companies that they talk to uh, do not measure, uh, the, the teams in, uh, in, the, in, the, in those companies do not measure the impact of design. So as designers and leaders and practitioners, we have the opportunity uh, to uh, turn these findings into lessons that we apply into our own organizations. Another very uh, important uh, study that was published uh, in at the tail end of 2018 is the Envision um, uh, New Design Frontier uh, Design Maturity Study. Uh, Leah Bewley and the design uh, or, and the education team at Envision uh, did this very comprehensive um, survey around uh, over 2,000 companies and um, in more than 77 countries. And what they um, uh, found that was, was very, very uh, interesting and telling. So they basically were able to define uh, the different levels of the design maturity uh, model. And uh, not surprisingly, only about 5% of the organizations that they surveyed are in that visionary level. And the majority, <laughs> Uh, or a, a large portion of the organizations that uh, participate in the survey are in that uh, level one, in that producer uh, level. You know, we're a factory of things, not an influencer in terms of defining uh, a strategy and, and the different aspects of the organization. But I think the most important lesson for us and for our organizations and our peers is that maybe not all organizations need to be on the visionary quadrant but maybe we need to move from producers to connectors or from connectors to architects. And maybe that is the appropriate level of maturity for us in our teams in a particular organization. So we, we should be encouraged, not uh, look at the, at, the glass, at the glass half uh, empty, uh, but look at the glass half full. What are the opportunities that we have to take advantage of this type of information and help our team develop. So uh, we go into a future together that it is uh, better and more impactful and better recognized uh, for design in our organizations. 
So, how do we uh, know if our team is successful? How do we measure the impact of design in our organizations? So, um, uh, last year, uh, the Design Operations Summit uh, that Rosenfeld Media put together, Kristen Skinner and um, uh, Abby, the IA, uh, put together um, this uh, uh, survey and they uh, provided some uh, very interesting findings in terms of the type of metrics that we can um, expect to have. Um, and also, uh, how do those, those metrics uh, impact either operations or design uh, in a wider perspective uh, in the organization? One of the most interesting things uh, that um, uh, Kristen Skinner, uh, uh, the way she framed uh, uh, the, the design management operation metrics, there's impact on people, impact on the practice, and imp impact on the, on the portfolio or the infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, do we have the right level of uh, compensation? Uh, do we have the career profiles uh, and the career ladder defined for our organization? That's obviously uh, at, the, at the level of people. Uh, do we have um, uh, the, the skills and the education in our uh, practice to develop and grow our teams? For example, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning as a new material uh, of design uh, for our teams and our organizations. Uh, are we getting uh, a, enough of the um, training and education that our team needs? Are we getting enough exposure of our teams outside of the organization? And obviously from a design platform and infrastructure perspective, are we providing our teams the tools and the technology that they need? Uh, do they have the platform uh, and the and the conditions and the support uh, that they need to, to uh, execute their job. For example, the research tools to uh, conduct moderated and unmoderated uh, research studies. Uh, so those are just some of the key things that will help us uh, operate in a, in a better manner so our team can have a, a higher level of influence in, in the organization. And obviously, from that point of view, uh, we all also develop uh, what our uh, management um, uh, set of metrics are uh, to demonstrate the value that we have to, to have in the organization. All of these elements are important. However, I think that the most important one, and without this one, we cannot get away um, with, is... It doesn't matter how much value, how much revenue we deliver to an organization if we're not doing that from an ethical framework perspective. Um, we can end up going to jail like it happened to the engineers in the mission scandal. Or we can be hurting people when we're enabling uh, bullying and doxing in our platforms. So the big question for us and the uh, a big part of the message of designing for good is how are we ensuring that our work is actually um, being used as intended and not a worst case scenario situation uh, like uh, it, you know the emissions or the bullying that I just mentioned. So it is very, very important for us uh, to nurture that in our teams and in our uh, organizations and in the culture that we uh, and the values that we uh, profess. So uh, wrapping up, I mentioned to you the need uh, for an individual reflection, a team reflection and an impact reflection. And all of these elements are super critical uh, considering the conditions and the circumstances uh, of, of, the, of today uh, as we look into evolving and uh, uh, developing the teams that we want and ourselves uh, for the future. I think it's very important for us to reflect, adapt, and evolve, and basically summon that inner chameleon in, 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 our, uh, in ourselves as we help our teams come together as a, as a group, as a community, and as a society to solve the big problems that we're facing today so we can leave a better future 
for the next generation of people that come behind us. Thank you very much, and thank you to um, to this uh, a great event and the lineup of speakers uh, for all, all the messages that you have shared. Thank you very much.